how are you? I'm really good, thank you, how are you? I'm great, thank you so much for being on the Red Booth Show. I'm happy to be on your Red Booth Show. <laughs> well everyone, we are here with David Morse, who plays Big Foster in the new show on WGN called Outsiders. Uh, why don't you tell us a bit about it and why you decided to play this role on the show? Well, really the thing that made me decide to play the role was the, uh, the world that this character lived in. Um, this is, it was not like a world I'd seen before and things that had been offered, things I've watched on, on, uh, on television. Uh, I thought it was just a great idea, this, uh, this uh, Appalachian community um, where you have, the, where you have a, uh, a, a town below that would, seems familiar to us and a clan on a mountain that's been up there for 200 years and with their own traditions, their own world, they raid the town below. It just was a lot of fun. Uh, but the character was originally conceived as being, he was really going to be there only for the first season and he was just a bad, bad individual. And when I was asked to do it, I didn't think he was as interesting as he could be if he was just a bad, bad individual. So, so that, that we, uh, we uh, addressed and it became really fun. Oh, that's amazing. So you helped sort of contribute to his character in a way? Well, one of the things about really about the experience of, of doing this show for the actors as well as the writers, this is not usual. Uh, usual, you know, usually the writers write the show, the actors act the show. But because this was a new world we were all discovering, we became, we the actors became involved with really helping to define the rituals and life on that mountain as much as the writers in some ways. Uh, because it was really starting from scratch. Uh, and, 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 and out of that, our characters uh, evolved as well. So for all of us, it's, it's really been an adventure. How cool, what a great creative process to be involved in. Really, truly, unusual. So with everyone that hasn't uh, seen the show yet, I thought that I would give a little description of season one. Now, you guys live obviously up in the mountains and you sort of have your own thing, your, your own culture up there. Then you have people down in the city, down in the town, and the uh, big company that comes in and wants to buy the mountain and actually does buy the property and wants to mine it and they're trying to kick you out. Um, is sort of the beginning conflict that's going on. Now you are next in line to be in charge of your whole little, you know, village that's up in the mountains. Will you tell us about what happens from there? Well, he was next in line to take over from his mother, who had promised him that he would become the Brennan years and years and years before. She never allowed it to happen, and he had to drown her, uh, you know, and she was just, it was just one of those things he had to do um, to, in order to become the Brennan, and he, and he does, be, and he did become the Brennan, and then, and then lost it when he was shot and left for dead, and Guinevere, who I had uh, stolen from my son and married her, uh, she became the Brennan at the beginning of the second season, this season. So that, that's kind of where we began, began this. The thing that just messed with everything is he actually fell in love with her and, and had never been in love and now was, uh, now is really confused by it. And, and, and all he knows is he's devoted to her and gonna stand by her side and she doesn't want anything to do with him. Jeez, that's quite a situation that he's gotten himself into there. Um, and you know, kind of cool that he's starting to have some emotions and care for this woman, but obviously there's a lot of conflict. And in fact, regarding your son, right? That's your son, the one that gets arrested and then he, get, he comes back to the, to the clan? Well, my son, my son, Little Foster, who, who was uh, um, uh, arrested and put in jail, and he's the last person on earth who should be in a, in a prison. He's, he's really kind of a pure soul, but uh, but dangerous in his own way and gets taken advantage of and he pushes back and, and uh, really bad things happen in that prison. We break him out in a great episode uh, where we, uh, we, we get on our ATVs and bring him back to the clan. Yeah, that's amazing. Actually, here is a clip of that moment right here.
why ain't you dead like you're supposed to be? What's this? Get your goddamn hands off me. Now, you know, I've really noticed something about this show is that it seems to be that the decision-making process for the clan is based a lot on myth and prophecy. Would you say that that's the case? Totally. The whole, the whole world is, is based on myth and prophecy and, and a, 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 a magic that belongs to the mountain, which we're not sure we've ever seen. It sort of makes little appearances in the first season, it starts to make some more appearances in the second season, and it's going to play a, play a big part in the end of the second season. Wow, that's such an amazing part of this show. I think it's a really cool element. And then also along with the obvious conflict um, between your people and uh, the mining company and everything else that's happening with the people down in the town, um, there's really so much going on. But the magic, I mean, it's just a really interesting story. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what do the people in your town or up in up in the mountains, I should say, in your little village, um, how do they feel towards the city people down below? Well, I think it's it's uh, it's sort of the same. When the story begins, is we kind of keep each other at a distance. With us, anybody who who actually disappears down below or spends too much time below becomes they're, they're called a losty. And in the first season, there was a character, Asa, who was the losty, who came back to us. Uh, but at the same time, the people down below in the town, there's so, many, so much fear of these people on the mountain. There's so many myths and stories about them. We don't really mix. But because of the coal company coming in, it really has brought us together, sometimes in good ways and sometimes in bad ways. The coal company really is manipulating both the town to get what the coal company wants and us. And we start to have more of a, a sympathy for each other. And I think that's, that's, you know, it's very human and very interesting. That's great. And that's going to be playing out more, obviously, in season two. It's more in season two, and we are, we are starting to work on season three, uh, you know, the writing of it. And, that, and it will, you'll, you'll see even more of it. Season two is what, what you, you really start to see this bridge. And uh, um, it'll be fun to see where it goes. Yeah, that's really interesting. Actually, how far do you think Big Foster will go to keep the mountain for his people? Big Foster will die for the mountain. He, he, has, no, he has no fear of that. And that, that's what makes him dangerous, too, because other people die because of his attitude, uh, which is it, it, that's starting to uh, weigh on him and, and change him. Well, that's very cool. It's such a wonderful character that you're playing because, you know, there's a, a hero factor there and also a villain mixed together. It's really interesting. So I definitely think people are going to enjoy the show when they tune in to watch Outsiders on season two. And also, I'm personally a huge fan of yours. I think you're an amazing actor. And I wanted to ask you, how did you start getting into the acting field? Like, how did you start your career? Well, I was... I was, I've been very fortunate, I have to tell you, uh, with, with the people in my life who, who have changed the direction of my life. Uh, in high school, really, really early on in high school, uh, there wasn't one team that would have me on the team. I auditioned for a play. You know, it's like a sort of a common story. A friend and I went and auditioned. My first experience on that stage, it really changed my life. It's all I did in high school. This woman who, who uh, taught there was a complete inspiration, both in theater but also in civil rights. She had marched with Martin Luther King, and uh, she, she, uh, she, was really, she was really somebody to set your, uh, your, your, set your course in life by. So uh, I went right from high school into a repertory company in Boston. I auditioned for it at 17 years old. I hadn't even graduated from high school yet. They asked me to become a part of the company. I did repertory theater for six years there and went to New York, and I've been doing it ever since. 
Wow, that's amazing. What a wonderful story. Um, I'm taking from this also that you're advising people to go and get into theater school. Would you say that's correct? Well, yeah, yeah. well, I, you know, when I went to New York, I had never studied, and I'd done all that, that repertory theater. But I did eventually study for two years in New York with a man named Bill Esper. Again, somebody who set me on, you know, a path. I'd been straying from, just in my acting, because it's so full of junk and, 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 and just a more truthful, not, a truthful, not just a truthful experience of acting, but a truthful experience of living your life. And um, I, I would recommend that people, if they can find a great teacher, to find a great teacher, uh, it, it, it will, it'll be really good for you. Well, David, thank you so much. It's been really wonderful hearing your advice and talking with you. And I hope that everybody tunes in to see season two of Outsiders. And thank you again for being on the show. It's been wonderful talking with you. Kimberly, thank you for having me. Well, everyone, thank you so much for watching my interview with the amazing actor, David Morse, um, and for watching The Red Booth Show. You can always tune in to see this show every Saturday night at midnight to get to know amazing actors and musicians and artists and other people in entertainment. So thanks so much for watching. I really wanted to put a deck on my house. The floor was creaking and there were cracks in the wall. I had them put in walls in my basement. Well, the whole thing was done on time, on budget, and not a day of work was missed. Alpha Structural is a top-rate company. I'd recommend them to anybody. If you live in a hillside home and gravity is pulling you towards the edge of the cliff, I recommend you call Alpha. It was a real pleasure to work with Alpha. Bye-bye. Hi. Hoping for a crisp breeze to help keep you alert. Oh, oh, he took a sip of water too. That'll probably help. You were probably gonna turn down the radio too, so you could focus, right? Probably okay isn't okay. Right? If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. I think the water line is what really drove it home. I blew on him. Are you aware of the term optics? I know, I know, people in PR use it way too much, but it does matter. My niece is an openly gay young woman protesting for free speech. Now, the optics of the situation, well, since you expelled her, there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, give us a minute. I spent half an hour on the phone with the superintendent. I'm guessing you are the one that got up his ass about this? Matt, this could be a fantastic opportunity for you. I'm not afraid of him. And I'm sure as sh not afraid of you. The Harrises don't reach this far. You're just another trailer trash Murphy around here. <gasps> what? You have a call waiting. It's the governor's office. Tell Jerry I said hi. Hi, Dana, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Great, well, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Sure. Well, I'm really excited. I know that you have season two coming up of Hand of God, and you play Crystal Harris, the wife of Pernell Harris, in the new season. Could you describe it to the new viewers? Yeah, sure. Um, the first season is available on, on Amazon Prime right now, so you can catch up. Um, basically, Ron Perlman plays this corrupt judge who thinks that God is speaking to him uh, to avenge our son's death. And uh, the whole first season, I'm thinking he's insane, but by the end, I'm complicit in his drama. And then the second season, um, which starts on March 10th, I am more involved. Uh, I'm separated from him because I have to deal with what I done and then I'm trying to avenge our son's death in my own way and find out who killed him. Wow that sounds pretty intense. Uh, there's definitely a lot going on as well with you and your husband in the show and I know that he gets sent to jail. Yes he's up for murder. Mm -hmm. Right and then there's this scene where you come and visit him. How would you say that your character Crystal feels about this whole situation? Well, um, she's a little uh, guilt-ridden herself, and he's still acting insane, so um, she's not happy about that. <laughs> I 
When did you get back? This morning. <laughs> what happened? You know, I was just finishing up my scotch at the core club when the SVPD's finest comes in with a warrant. Because I should have left sooner. Kept thinking you'd show. You look tired. Well, what can I say? It was a tough day. Why'd you go to San Francisco? Oh. What? Well, are you okay? CEO gave me a beatdown. Everybody just let it happen. You cannot do anything to encourage. You think I provoked this, Chris? They think I'm a cop killer. That's why I gotta get the hell out of here. Who's your new lawyer? I haven't figured that out yet. The hearing's in two days. I'll, I'll represent myself at the hearing. I'll oh, get you somebody. Never... How many people have done that in your courtroom? Did they win? Chris, I know the law, okay? I, I, I wrote the law. Right now, look at yourself. Look what you're wearing. You're not special anymore. Okay, right. Now, this situation with your son seems like a very pivotal part of the story um, and how you're dealing with that as well. Now, there's also this scene that I, that I have here, which I'm going to show everybody, where you're sort of unhappy and you're in this beautiful mansion and someone shows up to see you and they start talking about, um, I guess there's another woman or another wife that's involved. Can you tell us about that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's um, Ron's secretary, Randy, comes and asks me to go visit him in jail and I'm like well why don't you ask his other wife because in season two he married his uh, mistress <laughs> without me knowing it so yes he's a bigamist <laughs> oh my god okay so you're dealing with the fact that he's married to you and someone else at the same time and you're trying to help him while he's in jail yeah yeah well she wants me to help him um, I'm not sure I want to you know, Judge Purnell is a, is a complicated man. <laughs> he thinks he can get away with everything, <laughs> including murder. How'd you know I was here? Purnell asked me to put an alert on your Jones account. I get notifications every time you order. <laughs> What'd you get? Honey. So he knows I'm back. Not yet. You gonna let me in? If Purnell stopped on a dime, it would take a day and a half to dig cheap Toby out of his ass. Why did he go to San Francisco in the first place? I don't know. He's going to get out? Not if he doesn't get a new lawyer. Breeders quit. Nobody in this town wants the gig. He's made a lot of enemies over the years. And he's helped a lot of people, too. Some forget too soon. Look, Randy. I don't mean to rush you, but I have a guest coming for lunch, and I would really like to be ready. Well, maybe after lunch you could go see him. That would be good. <laughs> you don't have to love him. Just show up. He needs someone to talk sense into him. He needs his wife. He has two wives. Why don't you ask the other one? If you didn't come back for Purnell, why are you here? For my son. For PJ. Well, we'll see how he tries to get out of this one. Um, you know, I actually wanted to ask you what it's like working with Ron Perlman and, uh, you know, what was one of your favorite scenes so far on the show with him? I love working with Ron Perlman. Um, I... Just, I tell him every time we do a scene that I love working with him. Um, we got to do a great scene um, in our big palatial mansion uh, where he comes in and it's on a stairwell. And I can't really tell you what happens, but it was so intimate and touching. And um, he's just a great actor to work with because he's so present. And you don't feel like you're acting when you're acting with Ron. You're just kind of talking. It's great. Wow, that's wonderful. It must be so great. You know, both of you are such pros working together. Sounds like a lot of fun. 
Um, I also wanted to mention to you the fact that you've been in so many different shows and played so many different characters. What is it that you really like about Crystal, about this character? Well, um, I kind of think her name says it all. Crystal, I, I say that she's fake diamonds because even though she's a rich woman, she married into the money. And she actually comes from Stockton, California, from the wrong side of the tracks. And she kind of created who she is. That's not who she really is. So we get to see her go back to Stockton in season two. And you meet her mom and her sister, and you kind of see where she came from. And I think it all kind of makes sense then. Wow, right. So she's really presenting herself as this sort of a wealthy uh, woman, but she, really not who she is at all. No, it's not who she really is. Well, that's obviously why you are so amazing. You know, you can play these characters and, and create these worlds. And you've played so many amazing roles over the years. And you've been nominated. You've won awards. You've won Emmys. So what I would love to ask you, which is something that I, I like to ask most of my guests, is what advice do you have for other people who are aspiring to become, you know, an actress? Well, first of all, I always tell people you have to really need to act because, you know, it's not an easy career to do. Um, you can't do it because you want money or fame because that's going to come and go. So you really have to have almost a calling that you need to do this. Uh, otherwise, don't. And I think you just have to love it. I mean, I've been acting for almost 40 years and I still love it. Like I love going to work every day. I still get challenged by it. I still get excited by it. And it's just the work. So I think it's you have to understand why you're doing it first. Well, that's very good advice. Thank you so much for sharing. And you know, I have another question about the show. In the season two, I know that there's more going on with Ron Perlman, with the character between Crystal and him. And I was hoping that you could give us a little bit of hints about that. Um, well, you know, I think we're trying to figure out whether we're going to stay married or not. And for Ron's character, Purnell, his whole mission season two is to try to get me back. But I'm not sure as Crystal that I want to go back to him. So that's going to be, you know, throughout the whole season, whether we get back together or not. Um, and then you'll see what the answer is if you watch the whole show. Give this through your head. Oh, I haven't seen Tessie in months, and I have no plan to. I love you, and only you. And I don't want to see you torturing yourself. I don't give a about your girlfriend. I want answers. PJ. PJ is dead. That's what we get. You got to stop this. Did you stop? When people asked you to stop, did you stop? No. And it cost me everything. She stole from PJ. She had his wife raped off of that software, bathwater. What if I can find it? Well, it's not going to change what happened. We can move on from this. But we've got to do it together. For now, you need to get into your head that we will never do anything together ever. Well, I can't blame you on that one, uh, not wanting to get back together with him after all of that. But, um, you know, well, I guess we're going to find out in the new season, like you said. And I know that, you know, there's a possibility you might be even interacting with this other woman coming up. Is, is that something that we are going to be seeing? Um, yeah, she, um, she's kind of his stalwart, loyal secretary who will lie for him and do whatever he needs. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Um, but mostly my stuff is with um, my sister, who's played by a wonderful actress. And um, I, I'm happy that people will meet her. She's really fun to work with. Oh, okay, so that's really cool. We'll be looking forward to that in the new season. That's going to be, um, you know, a lot more involved, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. All right, cool. So also, what was it that made you want to be in Hand of God when you were first sent the script? Well, I'd only been doing uh, network television up until that point, and Amazon at that time was just starting to do, I think it was their second season of doing a whole slate of, of shows. So I was intrigued by that. I was intrigued that it was only 10 episodes, so you could do other things. Like right now I'm doing a play, and I couldn't have done that if I was on a network show where you do 23 episodes. 
Um, so I like that, and I like the people, Ron Perlman and Mark Forster. I liked his movies. He directed the pilot. He's one of our producers. So I was just kind of intrigued by the whole streaming thing. Wow, that sounds like a perfect situation for you, and um, definitely getting involved with streaming, I think, is the way to go, the way of the future, as they say. And Amazon Prime has a lot of great shows coming out, like Hand of God, so that's really cool that you are a part of it. Um, um, I'd love to hear about this play, though. Can you tell us a bit about it? Yes, I'm in Boston right now, and I'm doing uh, Tennessee Williams' The Night of the Iguana. And it's been a wonderful challenge for me. I'm working with James Earl Jones, Elizabeth Ashley, and Amanda Plummer, and they've all done Tennessee Williams before. They're kind of like experts at it. So this has been a great learning experience for me and a kick in the pants, and I'm having a ball. <laughs> That's awesome. So how can people see you in the play? Where should they go? When is it open? We are at ART in Cambridge until uh, March 18th. Well, that's very cool that you're going to that you're in this play and also that you're starring in Hand of God. And I just want to say thank you so much for your advice for everyone and for speaking with me on the Red Booth show. It's been great talking with you. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in to my interview with Dana Delaney, who's starring in Hand of God on Amazon Prime. Don't miss the Red Booth show every Saturday night where you can get to know actors, musicians, artists, and other people in entertainment and hear about their stories. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.